Good afternoon, and uh, thank you for joining us today. We're pleased to be joined by Colonel John Dorian, our spokesman for Operation Inherent Resolve. Uh, JD, just want to make sure you can hear us and we can hear you. I've got you loud and clear. Great. Without any uh, further ado, we will turn it over to you. Excellent. Good afternoon, Pentagon Press. Before I get started today, I want to take a brief moment to congratulate Jim Miklaszewski on his more than 30 years of outstanding journalism. I'm sure Mick's very busy right now preparing for a great day with his family and wish he was here to tune me up one last time just for old time's sake. I know many of you will be a part of his special day and I hope you'll pass on my best wishes to Mick and his family for a long, happy and prosperous retirement. We'll start with Syria today and then we'll move on to Iraq. At Star One in Syria, Operation Noble Lance is ongoing with Turkish military and partner forces continuing clearance of villages along the Mara Line near Syria's northern border with Turkey. As reported in multiple media outlets overnight, Daesh fired a rocket into Kilis, which is just north of the border in Turkey. Daesh launched more than 40 rockets into Kilis since January, striking an area that's populated highly by a significant number of refugees from Syria. Turkish forces and their partners and coalition forces have been involved in tough fighting in northwestern Syria because Daesh recognized this area is very important to their ability to export terror in the region and bring fighters into and out of Syria and Iraq. This area has been highly contested with back and forth fighting between Daesh and coalition supported opposition groups. As in Iraq, coalition forces are providing train, advise and assist support to Turkey and partner forces fighting Daesh. Since Noble Lance started, the coalition supported forces have cleared five additional villages, further complicating Daesh freedom of movement. Post -liber liberation stabilization efforts continue to be a priority. In this area, in the continuing effort to provide humanitarian assistance to Manbij, the coalition is facilitating the delivery of more than 200 metric tons of food that will be provided to about 2,400 families throughout the Manbij Organization for Relief and, De and Development. The food includes essentials such as rice, flour, chickpeas and tomato paste, baby formula and water purifying tablets. In some cases, this means families will get anywhere from 30 to 60 days of food and supplies. In addition, the coalition has provided training to remove many of the explosive remnants of war that Daesh typically leave behind once they've been driven from an area. Those trained by the coalition have successfully removed explosive remnants of war, enabling the reopening of the Manbij Hospital as well as many homes and schools in the city. In Iraq, we continue to see Daesh attempt to build up their defenses in Mosul, including restrictions on the population and attempts to conceal their operations in buildings that are restricted targets like hospitals, schools, and mosques. In addition, they continue to dig elaborate tunnels and place IEDs, hoping to delay the advance of the ISF. But there are significant signs that they're feeling the effects of ISF advances and coalition strikes. In some instances, like Kiara and along the Euphrates River Valley, we're seeing them conduct harassing attacks to try and delay the ISF but they're no longer able to mass enough forces to stop the advance and have shown more of an inclination to flee rather than earlier times in the campaign. In addition, we continue to see Daesh grumbling about money and supply shortages and reflections in social media indicating flagging enemy morale. In, Daesh's, in Iraq's Euphrates River Valley, forces from the 7th Infantry Division 
have started to clear the Euphrates River and entered the city of Kassirat in order to set conditions for the river cross operations to liberate the Jazeera hit area at Star 2. In the Jazeera Ramadi area at Star 3, forces from the 41st Brigade of the 10th Infantry Division have started to clear Abu Diab. These clearing operations further erode Daesh freedom of movement and reduce their ability to pressure the ERV or resupply from Syria. They also give Daesh more problems than they have the ability to manage simultaneously. Iraq and coalition forces are helping Daesh understand that condition as their new normal. At Star 4, the ISF announced yesterday evening that they had reached the city center of Sharkat, and Iraqis have been observed waving Iraqi flags and celebrating their liberation. The 34th, 35th, 73rd brigades of the ISF will continue to back clear Sharkat and the outlying areas, but the removal of Daesh from Sharkat moves them further away from Iraqi supply lines and inhibits their freedom of movement leading up to the liberation of Mosul. The ISF conducted the operation rather quickly, demonstrating their continued momentum and the enemy's inability to mass and stop them. In preparation for the liberation, coalition forces conducted multiple strikes in the area to deny the enemy access to key terrain, destroy 29 watercraft along the Tigris River, destroy enemy weapons caches, including vehicle-borne improvised explosive devices, and eliminate tactical units that may otherwise have been engaged in the liberation battle. As the ISF operation was ongoing, it became clear to Daesh that they were going to be defeated in place and they attempted to flee across the, a land bridge toward Hoeja with technical vehicles and more than 30 trucks. The coalition destroyed that land bridge, which you'll see in the video we've queued for you. Once that land bridge was gone, there was nowhere else for the vehicles to go, and an A-10, an F-16, and an MQ-1 all engaged to eliminate the vehicles with airstrikes, destroying them before they could escape to fight another day. Jeff, if you'd roll that footage. Questions once the video is complete. Got it. We'll uh, start with Bob Burns from the Associated Press. Hey, Colonel Doyen. Uh, there's reports of significant oil field fires uh, in and around around Kayara. I'm wondering if you can comment on the extent to which that might be an impediment currently for Iraqi operations, and also can you describe in some any detail what exactly what sort of activities U.S. forces are undertaking at Kiara? Are they operating outside the wire, for example? Bob, just to clarify, um, what you're talking about is uh, Kiara West is where the uh, coalition forces are operating out of, and in Kiara, this is where the preponderance of those oil fires are. Uh, er, the uh, Daesh set those fires before they uh, fleed from the area, and this, many of them remain burning. Uh, they do that for a variety of reasons. One is a spoiler, but they also do it in an attempt to mask their movements. So it, it does cause some problems. It certainly doesn't stop anything, and the Iraqis have uh, asked for coalition help to determine what could be done to put those fires out. Uh, we'll do what we can to support them. ...about coalition forces. Uh, we don't anticipate that they're going to be operating outside the wire uh, on a regular basis. Uh, they're busy uh, working uh, at the base to get it up and running as a, a uh, supply and logistics and staging area for the Iraqi security forces prior to the liberation of Mosul. 
Okay, uh, next to Tara Kopp with Stars and Stripes. Hi, Colonel. Um, just following on Bob's questions about Kiara, um, could you let us know about how many U.S. forces are at Kiara West? Um, and as far as the activities for building up the, the base, is that runway improvements, additional uh, artillery, um, and then just uh, further to for the Mosul fight, can you let us know what is the current number of Iraqi forces trained um, and what is the, uh, I guess, the status of how many brigades you'll need for this fight? Yep. Um, there are several hundred uh, troops at KRO West. They're very busy uh, building that up as a staging area for the Iraqi security forces. So what we're talking about here is getting the airfield up and running. Um, there is uh, an operational piece getting that airfield to work uh, so that it can be C-130 capable at some point. And there's also a piece where we're talking about bedding down the Iraqi security forces and staging uh, a lot of supplies and equipment that they'll need in order to go into what we expect to be a very tough fight for the liberation of Mosul. So those are the two big things for uh, Kiara West at this point. Um, as far as your question regarding the training, um, we've uh, got 8 to 12 uh, brigades ready for the Iraqi security forces to go into Mosul. Um, we've trained a total of more than 35,000 troops. Some have been through more than once. So what we're talking about with this, uh, we've got forces that have been involved in some of the liberation battles in the Euphrates River Valley, uh, and they've also come through for refit. Um, so a lot of that work uh, continues. Uh, we've got about 6,000 uh, there right now uh, that are, that are going to be used as a reserve and then for a wide area security forces. These are like police forces that will be used to hold the territory and make sure that security remains once Daesh have been pushed out of Mosul. Uh, and going back to um, uh, KRO West, there, there is artillery there as well, and that's used for disruption fires and then, of course, to make sure that uh, Daesh understand that it's probably not in their interest to approach that base. Okay, just a quick follow-up. Um, in some of the earlier briefings on Mosul, we'd heard that you would need like around 20 brigades to be ready to launch that attack. Is that still the case, or has, do you not need as many now? Well, what we're talking about is the, uh, the Iraqi army uh, there are also going to be brigades that are there for um, police. There are going to be Peshmerga brigades, uh, and there are likely to be uh, popular mobilization forces involved in some manner around the city. So all told, the numbers that you've been given are, are correct. We were talking about the, the uh, Iraqi army. Okay. Uh, next to Joe Talbot. Yeah. Uh, Colonel Dorian, I want to go back to, to Syria. Uh, what is the status of communication between the coalition and the Russian military in Syria? Have you started sharing any intelligence or information with them? Mm -hmm. Well, the, the, uh, the JIC uh, that had been proposed is basically on hold at this point, but we do continue to coordinate and deconflict air operations with the Russians. That's an arrangement we've had in place for quite some time, and what that enables us to do is make sure that our forces and their forces uh, don't uh, end up on the same altitude going against the same targets or target each other. To, to follow up, uh, could you clarify why the JIC is on hold right now? And uh, w when we talk about sharing information, have you started sharing any information about the Nusra, Nusra Front positions in Syria?
Yeah. Well, one of the conditions for setting up the JIC was that there was supposed to be a week uh, without hostilities. Uh, that condition hasn't been met, and I know that there are diplomatic efforts ongoing uh, to try and restart that effort. Uh, there is an interest in doing that in order to create better humanitarian conditions for the Syrians who have been affected. Uh, but I, my understanding is uh, that those diplomatic efforts are ongoing and so far haven't borne any fruit. That's a great question, sir. Uh, we have, we, we've seen reports here in Washington in the last few days saying that the U.S. military is looking to arm directly the YPG in, in Syria. Are you aware of that? Could you confirm any, uh, if, if, if it's going to happen? Yeah, we have a, a program called the Syria Train and Equip Fund in which we train uh, and equip our partners in Syria. That's the uh, Syrian Arab Coalition. Uh, so we've been doing that for quite some time and we'll continue to do that. The SDF, uh, which is our partner organization uh, of vetted forces in Syria, have been stalwart allies and done a, or stalwart partners and have done a very good job in taking the fight to Daesh. We continue to work with them, and we intend to keep doing so. Okay, and next to Carlo Munoz. Hey, sir, I just wanted to follow up on your comments about the PMUs likely to participate in the Mosul operation. You know, uh, we've seen them, you know, work fighting in Shirkat. There's talk about them moving into Hawija when that operation is ready to go. The PMU Commission in Baghdad says there's about 15,000 uh, militiamen ready to go into Mosul. Now, in previous briefings, it still seems that the Iraqi government is on the fence about whether or not to let these guys participate in the Mosul offensive. From what you're saying now, they're likely to participate. Does that mean that we should expect some sort of announcement that officially they will be part of that, of that, of that force that goes in? And if that's the case, how is the chain of command going to work with, with these guys um, on an operation of this scale? Mm -hmm. Well, what we expect to happen is that the Iraqis are going to continue to develop their plan. Uh, we advise and assist them as they develop that plan. And one of the elements of the plan is a political dimension that uh, basically requires, and this is something that the Iraqis are leading, uh, they, they're coming up with a plan that is politically acceptable to those who will participate and those who will be affected. We advise and assist them as they put that plan together, but at the end of the day, Iraq is a sovereign country and the determination about where forces will participate, how they'll participate, what their disposition is, those determinations will be made by the government of Iraq. A quick follow-up then, sir, from your military perspective and looking at these plans that are being developed, is there any, what are the chances of success for Mosul if the PMUs are not allowed to participate? Well, I'm not going to get into hypotheticals about whether one group or another will participate. Essentially, I'd be, you know, stepping into the decision-making process of the Iraqis. They're leading the planning effort. They're going to make the determination who's going to be involved in this and in what manner they'll do so. They'll also make the determination what they need. Thanks. Uh, next to Ryan Brown with CNN. Hello, Colonel. Um, I just wanted to... With, as we move on to Mosul, I know relatively recently they've been granted the authority to embed advisors at the battalion level, but it's only been used relatively sparsely. Do you anticipate doing that more as, as, US, as the Iraqi forces kind of make the approach to Iraq's second biggest city? Well, I've discussed this with General Townsend. He's mystified why it's uh, such an area of interest. Um, 
And, you know, essentially this is an authority that he's been given by the Secretary of Defense. Uh, if he needs to use it, he'll do so. He said, uh, when I've discussed it with him, that uh, he thinks that uh, it's not something that he has any immediate plans to do, but it's something that if, uh, if circumstances warrant, he won't hesitate to do. Now, just one quick follow-up. You mentioned this aid delivery in the Manbij area um, and that U.S. forces or coalition forces facilitated that. Can you talk a little bit about how they facilitated that, how, what their involvement in that delivery was? Yeah, you know, um, one of the key elements that we try to establish with all of our partners is a, a situation where um, once, you know, they need to uh, get beyond the, the piece of the effort where, um, you know, they liberate that area, that they can reestablish some degree of normalcy and stabilize the situation. So in Manbij, um, Dash had had quite a bit of time, more than a year in that area. They were deeply entrenched there. So we have uh, a situation where uh, the forces there had, uh, the, the Dash fighters there had emplaced a lot of improvised explosive devices. The people that were living in that area or people who were displaced from that area were living under really difficult squalor type conditions. And so you're just going to have basic human needs that have to be met. In addition to that, our forces are always, uh, you know, they have uh, medics and this sort of thing that uh, they can assist in treating some of the people that have been hurt uh, either in the liberation battle or as a result of the explosive remnants of war that are left behind. So we also conduct some training to make sure that those things can be removed uh, a lot, you know, really across a variety of, uh, of areas where we help. Thank you, Carol. Next to Tony Hi, John. Can you bring us up to date on the uh, infamous mustard agent Shell? A lot of stories are saying today conclusively that the U.S. troops were attacked by mustard agent. What was the result of the third test? I'm hearing it's inconclusive and you have to test further. What, what you've heard is correct. So let me just kind of walk through it a little bit. Um, on, the, uh, on the 20th, this indirect fire came into the base. Um, it was uh, well away from our forces. I won't get into exactly how far, but it was well away from them. And then we went in and uh, did some testing. They grabbed samples uh, from those, uh, from those uh, uh, weapons that, that came down on the base. Uh, they did immediate testing on them. One of them was a, a positive test for a mustard agent, and one of them uh, was negative. So we sent the samples out for more advanced testing. Those uh, test results also came back inconclusive. So we're going to do more advanced testing yet. Uh, it'll probably take us a couple days in order to get those results back. So t headlines and stories that say U.S. troops were attacked by mustard agent by ISIL rockets are inaccurate at this point because there's no evidence of that, conclusive evidence. Is that true? There's no evidence of, of that. Uh, there's no conclusive evidence on that. So we, we wait for the tests to come back. Next to Louis Martinez with ABC News. Hey, John. Has um, General Townsend made a recommendation to U.S. Central Command for additional forces to, um, for the push to Mosul? Louis, we, uh, we don't talk about troop proposals. I would say that uh, we continually assess what we need, and if we need something, we will ask for it. But that will be done through military channels up through the leadership as appropriate and not something that we do as a public thing. If you needed more troops, what kind of specialized troops would you need? Uh, 
That's a hypothetical, Louie. I'm not going to touch that one. Uh, next to Gordon Lubold. I'm oh, sorry, actually, Lucas, you were next. Lucas Tomlinson and Gordon. Gordon, you want to go? No, you go. I don't know if I have a question yet. Okay. okay. Um, Colonel, if the test on the, for mustard agent was inconclusive, what exactly was that oily substance that was on the shell? Lucas, we're going to have to wait until the, uh, until the tests come back in order to determine exactly what was there. So certainly with the level of attention that this has gotten, uh, we'll let you know once we know. Thank you. And uh, going back to the, the Mosul fight, are you seeing ISIS fighters digging in, preparing for a big battle? Can you talk us through that and some of the challenges in uh, taking the city? Well, Daesh have been in Mosul for more than two years. They've built intricate defenses there. They've dug in, they've put up things like T walls, big barriers to stop people from coming in or slow in advance. They've dug trenches. I've seen reports that they've poured oil in some of those trenches with intent to start them on fire. Um, essentially, they've built a hell on earth around uh, themselves, and they're going to be in that whenever the Iraqi security forces come in there and push them out. Uh, Thank you. To, uh, Gordon yeah, hey, Colonel. Um, thanks for this. Two quick questions. Uh, one is, can you expand a little bit more on, uh, on potential uparming of YPG? I know what you said earlier, um, but is there uh, an argument to be made that, that expanding the assistance perhaps more directly to the YPG ahead of uh, the Raqqa fight um, could be beneficial and potentially what form could that take? And also, could you just clarify on this, uh, this idea that um, U.S. troops are using white phosphorus on the ground for things that potentially are beyond screening um, uh, on the ground and potentially in violation of, of uh, international law? Well, I'll start with the white phosphorus one. Um, those are being used in accordance with uh, our rules. They're being used in accordance with uh, the laws of armed conflict, and we always uh, attempt to do the very best that we can to use any of our weapons, be they white phosphorus or any other, in a manner that has a minimal or as little as possible impact on civilians. So what you've cited there is some allegation. I'm not aware of any allegations against U.S. forces for their use of white phosphorus at all. Uh, but if you have anything on that, I, I welcome it, and we'll, we'll answer it. Um, now, your other question about uh, the arming of the YPG or other groups, we have for a long time been arming the SDF, and the, uh, the group in that SDF that we've been working with very closely is the Syrian Arab Coalition. So I'm not going to get into pre-decisional or any type of uh, uh, philosophical discussion as far as, uh, you know, who we might arm directly. We arm the SAC, uh, and that's, that's the nature of our relationship. Uh, follow up with uh, Tara, or actually Richard, did this here? Yeah, hi, Colonel. Um, uh, can you possibly uh, give us some more clarity on the strike uh, on Deir Azor that uh, allegedly kills Syrian troops? Uh, first, uh, were U.S. aircraft manned or unmanned part of that strike? The reason I ask is that there's some reports, that, well, Britain, Denmark, and Australia have said that their aircraft were part of that package. And there are some reports out there that perhaps U.S. aircraft were not part of this at all. Were U.S. aircraft part of this? And secondly, can you say, sir, um, uh, the other reports that perhaps it wasn't Syrian army troops that were hit, 
that it was uh, prisoners that uh, ISIS pushed out in front uh, to try to lure an attack. Can you clarify anything on that? Well, I can clarify there were U.S. Uh, forces involved in that. There were U.S. aircraft uh, that were there. Um, I can clarify that piece. As far as the rest of it, um, who was on the ground, who those forces were, uh, we need to let the investigation play out. So there's been a lot of speculation about that. It's time to just go ahead and let the investigators investigate and we'll get to the bottom of it and we'll release information on the other end about exactly what we believe happened there. Just, uh, just one more, Colonel. Uh, uh, one star has been, uh, been appointed to uh, conduct the investigation. Is, uh, is, that, uh, is that General, uh, is he on the ground now over there? I'm afraid I, I don't know. I'm going to have to uh, owe that one to you. I'll see whether I can get an answer for that. Okay. Did you have a follow-up, Tara? I did. On the, the Mandage um, aid drops, um, could you tell us what type of U.S. aircraft were involved in that and whether the U.S. Is, would consider doing any sort of similar type of aid drop uh, over Aleppo at this point? Tara, I'm, I'm not sure. I, I didn't catch the entire question. Okay. Uh, just to repeat, um, could you tell us what U.S. aircraft were involved in the aid drop over Mambidge and whether or not the U.S. would consider doing a similar type of aid drop to Aleppo? I should, uh, I should clarify, I believe those, uh, those aid, uh, that aid was delivered by truck, not by airlift. So at the, all right. Aleppo part. On the Aleppo part, I mean, would there be any role for U.S. forces at this point to be able to deliver aid to Aleppo? No, the, the, uh, the international community has the lead for aid into Aleppo. Uh, we don't have a, a, a U.S. military mission there at this point. Okay, we're, uh, yeah, go ahead. I just want to point out that we, we do want to clear out a bit early because then we need to make some preparations in here for the special occasion this afternoon. Just one quick uh, follow-up, Colonel. Who is the one-star general that has been appointed to investigate the incident in eastern Syria? I'm afraid I'll have to owe you that one to you as well. Okay. Anyway, yeah, Ryan, go ahead. Uh, Colonel, on, uh, on Noble Lance, you said you described the capture of the five villages is very tough fighting, um, highly contested. I mean, any of the U.S. Uh, or coalition personnel involved in that operation, have they been involved in it directly in any of that fighting, or have they been exposed to any of that fighting? Our, our participation in northern Syria is just like it is in Iraq. It's an advise and assist role, and generally our forces are uh, away from the fighting. So uh, they may be nearby, but they're in an advise and assist role, not directly involved in fighting. All right, anybody else? All right, uh, JD, thank you very much. Strikes to support those operations and have done a considerable number of them. J.D., thanks for your time and for uh, coming to see us in what I know is late uh, evening your time. Uh, so uh, uh, get to bed, and uh, we wish you uh, all the best.
Thanks a bunch. Take care. Thanks, everybody.